So today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about one another relationships. And so I think there's been a romanticizing of one another relationships uh, to an ungodly extent in the world. And I think that this kind of perspective has made its way into God's kingdom. Have you ever heard these kind of loving phrases? You complete me. You're my everything. Raise your hand if you've heard these, these phrases before. Right? They're pretty popular in our culture. But think about what they communicate. If you have that particular person, do you need anyone else? If this person completes you, if they're your everything, um, that's not a good thing. And that's actually not a biblical way of looking at one another relationships, romance, love, the, et cetera. And we're going to get into that. But I want to just make clear, my hope for today is that you are challenged to rethink how you think about one another relationships and that thinking will transform your relationships. Cool? Ecclesiastes 4. Ecclesiastes 4. Starting in verse 7. It says, Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling? He asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So the book of Ecclesiastes is considered wisdom literature. And throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, the writer highlights many meaningless things. And here he adds another one <laughs> to the list of meaningless things. And it's being alone. It's being alone. Let's look closely at what he gives, the reasons why it's important to have relationships with people. So, well, actually, let me back up. Let me back up. So, verses 8 talks about there's a man. He doesn't have son nor brother. He has work and he has abundance. But even with work and abundance, it's meaningless. The scripture says a miserable business. I love that. A miserable business. <laughs> and then he goes on to list the reasons why we need people in our lives. You get a better return for your labor or work. So if you've ever had to build anything or do any kind of work, you know that it's easier when you have assistance, when you have help. Now, in our culture, there, we do this thing where it's like, I'm, I'm be it's better if I just do this by myself. Now, I do believe there are works in which God calls us to do by ourselves. Nobody can repent for you, right? No one can take care of your house, essentially, and yourself. These are things you have to do. This is a work you have to do. But when we think about what the scriptures posit, 
It's community, as um, Rodrigo talked about last week. It's community. So it's better to have someone helping you with the work than doing it alone. I mean, if you're a parent, is it easier to parent by yourself? Or is it easier to do it with someone else? <laughs> I'm not, I'm, now, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying it's without challenges. But you work. You got to come home and cook for your kids. You got to clean the house. You got to wash the clothes. You do all that by yourself. All that by yourself. What, what is easier? I mean, it's, it's, you know, I think it's simple. Someone else have, having the other parent there, it makes it easier. Shared work brings a better return, the scripture says. It also says if one falls, the other can help them up. Imagine falling. I, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure we all have. Imagine falling in such a way that you can't get up by yourself. Right? If you've played sports like I have, I've sprained my ankle so many times. And it is painful when you sprain your ankle and you're down. You like, somebody, please, please. <laughs> Both arms out, a foot out, help a brother up. The scripture says, two, addresses this issue. When you fall, when you're hurt, maybe when you're sick. It says, Two can help keep someone warm, keep each other warm. Now, I know sometimes when we think about the scripture, when we think about two laying down, keeping each other warm, it's so easy to think about man and woman. Uh, but I would remind you of how the scripture begins. There's a man all alone that has neither son nor brother. He's not talking about a wife. And I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. But he's not talking about a wife. They, if they lived in a nomadic style, they lived in tents. You're exposed to the elements. And it gets cold that night. You cozy up to keep each other warm. It says if one, one can be overpowered, two can defend themselves. Right? So there's kind of a, there's kind of like an implicit suggestion that like by yourself, you could take some L's. You're probably going to take more L's by yourself than if you have somebody else who can fight with you. A loss. I'm sorry. L and L is a loss. Is a loss. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you know, you know, in many ways, I feel like our church culture has and maybe even in some places um idolized marriage and we funneled a lot of scriptures through the idea of marriage you might have read or heard this scripture uh verses 9 through 12 used at weddings right and it's a beautiful idea of a man and a woman and god being a strand of three cords that's not quickly broken i think that's that's a that's an amazing picture but this section is not talking about marriage it says a man alone without a son or a brother, not a wife. In this scripture, the remedy for this man's loneliness and kind of the unsatisfactory life that comes with loneliness is a sibling relationship or parent and adult child relationship. It is not. A wife. It is not a wife. So when the scripture says a strand of three cords is not easily broken, given the context of the scripture we just explored, it's not talking about input God. It's talking about input another person. If two people have a better return, how about three? What about three? Can three have an even better return than two? Now, no. We have a particular understanding of this scripture. And what I'm presenting to you, you've probably never thought about before. Probably. I don't want to offend anybody's intellect. 
But I want to make it clear that this is talking about one another relationships, the kind of one another relationships you can have with your sibling and your child, your adult child. I was, I'm was i saying adult child because it says two can defend themselves. Elliot ain't helping me, right? <laughs> right? Elliot ain't helping me keep warm, right? So I, I, is, I mean, he, he is. <laughs> I love you, Elliot. <laughs> but I think you understand, right? Like, if 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 a if a group of people come to steal our belongings, me and adult Elliot will have a really good chance fending them off than me and my four year old boy, right? So this is why I'm saying adult child. So God says the cure to this loneliness and needing of a suitable helper is sibling adult child. This builds on an idea from Genesis, Genesis 2, where it says, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be what? Alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Adam is in the ideal place. He has everything he needs, yet he doesn't. God notices something. He is alone. And this is not a good state. So what I'm going to do is I am going to create another person for you. In the context of Gen Genesis, yes, God gives this man a wife. But in Ecclesiastes, the one another relationship is not restricted to the wife. So I want us to think about this. Continually, the scriptures teach us that needing of help, the curing of loneliness is another person. Sometimes I think we think we need, we're, we're like created to be monks. That like somehow we're going to pray, we're going to fast, we're going to read, and that's going to cure us. And sometimes when people come to us sharing these things, bro, you need to get closer to God. What's wrong with you? Feeling lonely out here? You need to get closer to God. How's your prayer life? Let me ask you this. How do you think Adam's prayer life was? What do you think Adam's relationship with God was? Do you, would, would we dare to say it was sufficient? But God still said, you, even having full access to me, no sin in the world yet, you need another person. You need another person. I want to expand on this idea just a little bit more in like a practical sense. Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. Hmm. You want to be a wise wife? Who are you walking with? <laughs> you want to be a wise college student, high school student? Who are you walking with? Who are you walking with? See, some of us have this weird way of thinking, and I did too, and it had to be corrected. I thought, and I get married, that's going to address this one another thing. It's going to be covered. I got my shorty. We good. I don't need nobody else. <laughs> I have my beautiful wife, my significant other. All right. Uh, <laughs> I thought 
as a single person, I thought, once I get married, I'm good. But that's also a lie if you're a single person. That's a lie. That, like, when you get a spouse, your one another relationship stuff is covered. And I want to share that it's bigger than that. One another relationships is bigger than that. It's not just about your spouse, but some of us, some of us have shrank our scope of one another relationships to like, I have my spouse, I have my, I have my kids, I'm good. I have my single friend, I have, I'm good. And when you think about what you need to be wise in, does your spouse cover all of that? Does your kids cover all of that? Does that one, two good friend cover all of that? I would argue it does not. They do not. It's not like you got like Jesus. No one person, two people have the wisdom that you need to reach your full capacity. So the question is, who are you walking with? Who are you walking with? You want to be an exceptional high school student? Who are you walking with? Who are your friends? You want to be an exceptional college student? Who are you walking with? Who are your friends? Who's in your life? You want to grow in your marriage? Who are you walking with? Who are your friends? See, what Ecclesiastes, I don't know if I'm saying that right. <laughs> Ecclesiastes and Genesis highlights is these one another relationships. And I believe there's a tie to what Jesus said. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. There, they will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you have done for the least of these, Whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Do you see the connection? The, in Ecclesiastes, we're talking about keeping warm. We're talking about fighting off enemies. We're talking about labor and work. The scripture makes it clear how our one another relationship should be and how essential and important they are to God. What he created us for? And then how he's going to like judge us based on how we're taking care of each other. I mean, Jesus says it again in this way. Maybe this one will hit a new command. I give you love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another by this. Everyone will know you are my disciples. If you love one another, do you think it would take love to fight off enemies? Do you think it would take love? to help somebody with their work? Do you think it would take love to help keep somebody warm, to pick them up when they fall? Absolutely, absolutely. But I want us to understand that it's not limited to how I think sometimes we've limited it. I have my wife, I have my couple good friends. If you wanna be wise for life, you need a community. You need a community. If, if you want to be a great husband, you, you need examples of great husbands. If you want to be a great father, you need examples of great fathers. If you want to be a great business person, maybe one of the husbands and fathers don't cover that. You need somebody wise for that. Can you see how, I mean, how many relationships would you have, would you need if you just covered uh, 
just a few of those areas. I think one of the problems when I read the scripture about the new commandment that Jesus gave, I think a problem that we had, we have sometimes is how we read it. Well, let me speak for myself. I have some time. It's how I read it. And this is how I read it sometimes. Love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Does that sound right? It's not right. Because what's missing is the most important part. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know you're my disciples. Now, this may sound harsh. Your love doesn't mean that much if it don't resemble the love of Christ. I'm going to repeat that. Your love don't mean that much if it don't resemble the love of Christ. And sometimes I think we fool ourselves. We want to love people the way we want to love people and not the way God says. And when they don't accept it, we get upset. We get upset. Are we loving the way Jesus loved us? That's the calling. That's the calling. The Bible goes on to say people won't even know you're a disciple if your love doesn't resemble Christ. They won't know who you pledge allegiance to. Is he, is he saved or something else? Maybe, maybe she's into witchcraft. That's, that's what that glow is. <laughs> I'm being extreme, but the scripture says people won't be able to identify you as having a close bond with God. That's pretty huge. The truth is that we are literally made for one another. We are literally made for one another. The needs that we have on this side of eternity are supposed to be met by each other. It's supposed to be met by each other. If you want to look at Genesis, you want to look at Galatians, not Galatians, Ecclesiastes, you want to look through the Gospels. It comes up over and over how we're supposed to take care of each other. What the church is supposed to look like. So as we prepare to take communion, I want us to think about how Jesus loved you, how Jesus loves you, how he picked you up when you were fallen, how he kept you warm in this cold world, how he shares in your workload, how he helps you fight off the enemies, how he gives you the wisdom that you need for this life. How are you replicating that in your one another relationships? What wise people are you walking with to grow wise? And what people are you walking with to make wise? You know, it's, it's in Mercer that I heard this phrase, doing life together. Doing life together. And I think that is a great thought I actually think that it's, it's spot on for what the scriptures teach. But is it just a nice thought? Or is it your lifestyle? Is doing life together with other people just a nice thought? Or is it your lifestyle? With that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for this breeze. Thank you so much for the sun. Thank you so much for our fellowship. Thank you so much for blessing us with your church. God, we know that you give us everything that we need. And you make it very clear that a lot of it is supposed to be met by each other. 
God, I pray that we won't be afraid to step into this huge responsibility, this blessed responsibility of caring for each other, for picking each other up, for keeping each other warm, for helping each other fight. We know that you have given us your Holy Spirit to empower us to be able to do these things. We need not fret. Thank you for the amazing example Jesus set. He has done all of these things for us. We, we, we see it so clearly with him dying on the cross for us, willing to sacrifice it all so that we can have a relationship with you. God, I pray that you will give us the wisdom to seek out the relationships we need so that we could be great in high school, in college, at work, in our marriages, wherever we are in, the, in our lives right now. I pray you will give us the wisdom to find the relationships that we need so that we can be our best for you. We pray for the bread that rec represents Jesus's body that was broken and the juice that represents the blood that was spilled. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.